Welcome to the Better Business, Better Life show. I'm your podcast host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor. In this podcast, I interview business owners, EOS implementers, and business experts who share with you their experiences, tips, and tools to help you create not only a better business, but also a better life. At the end of each show, you will have three tips or tools that our guests share that you can implement immediately into your life. If you want more information or want to get in contact, you can visit my website, debra.coach. That's D-E-B-R-A dot coach. Please enjoy the show. Today, I am joined by Paul Barron, who is the founder and CEO of The Wall Printer, uh, but also a serial entrepreneur. We've just been having a quick chat beforehand, and, and Paul has, has done many businesses in his life. Welcome to the show, Paul. Thank you, Deborah. It's a pleasure to be here, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and your audience. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you're joining us from North Carolina, which is um, right near the beach, and uh, you were sharing that you're a bit of an avid sailor as well, which kind of gives some some linkages to the, the Kiwis over here. We love our sailing. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. And, and aside from the America's Cup beatings that you used to give us, or vice <laughs> versa, um, I do enjoy uh, the experience of watching sailing in your beautiful waters. Oh, thank you. Hey, look, Paul, I would love for you to share uh, with the listeners your your journey to where you are now. So a little bit of your history, where you've got to, and what you're up to these days, What you're and what you're most proud of. Well, uh, number one, I'm 72 years old, so I'm most proud that I'm actually here talking to you. <laughs> um, and, and so, and I won't bore your audience with uh, Paul was born at a very young age and carry you through the full 72 years during this conversation. I don't think you have enough time, <laughs> nor, do, nor do I think your your audience could stand to hear all of it. Um, but suffice to say that career-wise, um, I've been basically product and industry agnostic. And what I mean by that is, I've always tried to find my passion, something that um, I would uh, take uh, to market, um, whether that be myself or the company's products I work for or services or something that struck my fancy um, mm -hmm. because I thought it might be innovative and there'd be a, a, a solution to a problem. Um, no entrepreneur or any business or creator um, should ever try to come up with something that is a um, a problem that they're creating just to have a solution to it. You have to have a very real problem or market gap uh, for the reason to uh, promote, build, or uh, create and market you know, any service or product, whether it be mm -hmm. technology or something very hard like consumer packaged goods or things like that. In my career, I've actually learned what hats I like to wear and which ones I don't like to wear. Ah, good. Um, I've, owned, I've, owned, I've owned businesses from restaurants to software development, um, to consumer packaged goods, um, to uh, uh, all sorts of service businesses and products. Over the last probably 15, 20 years, I developed a calling, if you will, for helping companies outside the United States. I'm not going to call them foreign companies because I'm foreign to many of your listeners, um, but uh, companies that had products that wanted to identify their audience here in the United States and find mm -hmm. a place for its products, whether it be for revenue purposes, partnerships, strategic alliances, positioning their companies for exit or sales. And so I, I managed to uh, develop quite a, a good reputation in this regard. I represented a Russian technology company with audio and video technologies for about 12 years. Wonderful relationship. Won't get into current politics, but the people are absolutely wonderful as they are in most countries in the world, um, if you give them a chance. And so um, 12 years, I represented this company until I did pretty much all I could for them uh, with their audio and video solutions uh, to um, hardware and device developers. Um, there was, uh, you know, like the, the video in Skype was this technology that I licensed to um, Skype at the time, now owned by Microsoft. There was um, any Apple uh, iPad, iPod, iPhone music clip that you hear with MP3 technology was software that I licensed to Apple through this company. So it was a very wow. good and profitable relationship. And that was my first foray into um, the world that, that I entered for about the past 20 years. And that really started because I was representing an American company um, who asked me to bring their product to market here in the United States. And the Russian product was, was a directly competitive solution. It actually was much more elegant than the company that I was representing. And they had a lot more depth to it. 
after a trade show, we would go out and we'd be what you'd call, I guess, frenemies. We'd sit down, we'd have a couple of vodkas. Those boys could drink. <laughs> um, yes, I'm and, sure. <laughs> uh, and, and, and invariably, the conversation would come around to, hey, Paul, how come you landed that deal with Motorola or XYZ company? And, and we, we all know that our technology is better than yours, but yet you got the deal. And I looked at them very frankly and with no disrespect at all, said, well, the real difference is you're Russian and I'm not. And what I meant by that was that there's a lot of cultural differences that are barriers to people's success when they try to communicate uh, with other cultures and other nationalities. And so I was able to take, whether it be a product, a service, a technology, I kind of know just enough about things to be dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in anything, but I'm a, I guess I'm a dilettante across the board in many different subjects. And after a little bit of research and homework, um, I can speak fairly intelligently to the point that I don't get thrown out of the room of those people that are much more proficient than I am. Yeah. So um, so they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. That led to a relationship where I joined that company, worked for them for about 12 years, as I mentioned. And then I did as much as I could for them. And I went on to something else, actually an Australian company that had a self-service dog wash. I helped them market Ooh. that into the United States. There was yeah. a Chinese headband headphone for children, um, a baby bottle manufacturer from Austria, and a <laughs> media board, another technology solution from Israel. And I took all these products and helped these companies in the United States. But I did this mostly, Deborah, as a hired gun. And what I mean by that is I was a commissioned salesperson. Sometimes I would have equity in the business. And before all of this started, I did own several of my own businesses. And I always liked the challenge of, of creating it, of hiring people. But again, I the hats I like to wear the most were the customer relationships, were the sales, the marketing end of things. I didn't like managing people. I didn't like the financial aspects. I didn't like legal and accounting. And so I gravitated to those positions that were more business development, market development positions. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but I retired a couple of times throughout the years uh, because fortunately, financially, I, I did very well for myself and my family. And I was happy with the kind of various products that I was representing. Uh, but I always longed for just ownership. And yep. so I, I was retired and I was sitting around. And once again, another company who's now a competitor of mine, uh, a German company. And once again, no disrespect to anybody in your audience who might have German heritage. Um, mm. I, drive, I drive a BMW. I cook with Henkel knives. Um, I think they're the best in the world in both respects. But just because something says made in Germany or made in New Zealand or made in America, that doesn't mean automatically it is the best of breed. Uh, you have to really look at it, find out what do you what do you want this product for? What again, what solution is it solving? And does mm -hmm. it meet the needs of you and whatever you're trying to achieve? If that's customer engagement, if it's profit, if it's your own you know, use, you know, what are the advantages of this product over others? So it was a very cool product. It was a vertical printing machine. It was like a, an inkjet printer on steroids is how I call it. Um, it was a machine that would print a digital image uh, that you would capture on just a USB stick and import it into the, um, into the printer, like you yep. would with any photo that you want to print on even your desktop printer. Um, and it would print this with a vertical rail and a print head that moved up and down, um, exposed to the to a wall, and it would print any size on any surface, indoors or outdoors. Well, I thought this was the coolest thing I had ever seen. I'm not mm. an artist, but I know what I like. Um, if your audience, I believe you have video in this. Um, yes. This image behind me, my office wasn't my office staff wasn't nice enough to give me a window in my office, so I had to. <laughs> I you printed, wall printed your one. own window. <laughs> so I had to paint my own window. And so that's a wall painting, a uh, five feet by eight feet that was done with one of our devices. Um, and so again, I explored this German product that approached me. I liked it so much. I wanted to really buy into it and buy the company, uh, but they they wanted me to be a, a salesman, a commissioned right. salesperson. And so I said, no, that that's not for me. Thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. But then I loved the product. And so I would invariably, whenever I found these types of things, I would call to my wife who would be in another room in my house. And I'd say, hey, honey, come take a look at this. Well, invariably, instead of doing what I requested, um, she would then cut up my credit cards and hide the passwords from my <laughs> bank accounts because she goes, here we go again, Paul's going to invest in something nuts. And so this time she took a look. She thought it was really cool too. And she said, if you think you can market something like this, go for it. So um, because we agreed on that, 
um, I did my homework. I found out that there were only a handful, literally five companies in the world that made these types of machines. None of them in the United States. Right away, that got my eyes all lit up because I said, here's an open market. And that's one of the reasons the German company approached me. Um, mm -hmm. And I discovered that the best one in the world was the originator of the technology. They were a company based in China, uh, but they had some American components in their machine. Uh, uh, it performed features that the German product did not at a fraction of the price. Um, that product was was a product that retailed for about seventy thousand um, dollars. My product pre retails for about thirty thousand dollars. Just to put things in perspective, it's not your one hundred dollar desktop printer. It's a thirty thousand dollar commercial printing machine. Mm -hmm. um, and so I uh, I started the courtship, if you will, the dance with the manufacturer. Um, fast forward a year or two, when I was doing this in two thousand and nineteen, um, we reached an agreement. Um, I became a co-owner. Um, I have rights to, and I own the entire Western Hemisphere, um, North America, South America, the Caribbean, Mexico, um, everything in the Western Hemisphere, uh, have a distribution network, the rest of the world. Um, yep. I own three patents on the machine with the Chinese manufacturer, which is a credit to not only me, but it's a, and again, I'm not patting myself on the back when I say this, but it's a credit to the relationship, which is the most important thing, not only in my business today, but really in any business I've ever had, the relationships you build. And the relationship I have established and built up and nurtured with the Chinese manufacturer has resulted in us co-owning several patents on some of the innovations that I brought to the party, so to speak. And so being able to do that speaks to the solidity of the relationship that we have together. And mm -hmm. it's grown tremendously. I've taken a company, their company, and expanded their market traction. Um, I built our company from a company that had a product that nobody had ever seen or heard about before. We have in the past three years put over 135 new businesses in place, which is really what we're about. I've described everything about this machine, and that's all well and good. But ultimately, my business, the wall printer, is really about creating business opportunities for entrepreneurs and established businesses who could use this to deliver beautiful artwork to their customers. So our customers are typically anybody from a startup, mm -hmm. um, somebody who just sees it as a cool machine like I did and mm -hmm. wants to do uh, a little bit of creative artwork in restaurants, schools, hospitals, people people's homes, event spaces, or it's a company that has an established business that has what I call adjacency, like painters, photographers, muralists, general contractors, people who know their market, know their customers, and want to have something that could add more value to the work they already deliver. I'll take a breath and let you ask me questions. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That's very comprehensive. I really appreciate that. I suppose I want to delve a little bit deeper into, I mean, what you've talked about is, you know, when you get come up with a new sexy product, um, I've seen this because I used to work with the Ice House. We did lots of work with startup businesses and they come in, they've got, oh, we've got this great idea. But it was the idea based around technology rather than around a customer pain point. And you've been very, very clear that if you want to launch a new product, it's got to have, it's got to address a particular pain point. It's got to be something that's actually significant enough that people are prepared to invest in actually, um, you know, engaging with that product or service to deal with that pain point. How do you check that? How do you do your validation? What do you do to see whether or not this really has legs? So that's a great question. So after the, after the, uh, after the euphoria of the initial um, reaction to a product or service or technology fades a little bit, you do have to get into, well, who wants this? Um, not only who wants it, but what benefit does it have for somebody? Um, yeah. The reason I, I really, this struck me is that uh, even though I'm not an artist myself, um, uh, I know that there, and I have pictures and posters and photographs on the walls in my home. Um, I know that there are very limited ways of putting artwork on walls. You can mm -hmm. have somebody hand paint something. You can yep. have a framed picture or poster or photograph. Um, you can put a, a vinyl decal sticker on a wall. You can have wallpaper that might have a nice design, or you can have something hand paint. Um, so uh, there, there are very limited ways. That's about it. And so I, I said, when I saw this machine, I said, well, this is this is pretty cool. And and, and there seems to be a, a, a need for something like this. Um, and then I got into the numbers. Well, can people make money on this? Can people afford to actually buy it once I go into the costs on it? And so I did my homework in that regard. Like, what does it cost to do a picture like this? This five foot by eight foot picture, 40 square feet, um, something like that 
costs our customers about $800 at $20 a square foot, which is typical price that our customers charge their customers. Many right. of them get much more than that, but $800 for something like this. You'd pay two to three times that if you had an artist paint that. And it yeah. took our machine two hours to print that, where it would take probably a week or two for somebody to hand paint something like that. And again, it's comparable to a vinyl sticker in terms of cost. But then the real question for me is because I wasn't looking to provide the services. I'm not interested in actually doing this painting. I wanted to make people a business opportunity so that they could buy the machines. It would be worth $30,000 for them and they could get a payback that would help them achieve the financial goals for themselves, their families, their employees, their businesses, and of course, create value for their customers. And so, uh, so when I went through the numbers on something like this, I found out that something like this really had total labor, ink costs, everything else, less than $250 in terms of time, labor, and everything else, bringing this machine that weighs 125 pounds, you know, to a customer site, as opposed to, you know, paying somebody to print something in a print shop on what's really a much more expensive printing machine to be able to print a vinyl sticker or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. And our Ink, of course, goes on walls and surfaces uh, that that vinyl stickers cannot do. Uh, we go indoors, outdoors. We go on on cement, like you see here on my wall. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even have to be a smooth wall. We print on rough surfaces too, like brick or garage doors or things like that. Um, just beautifully, it would print on that foam behind you. <laughs> oh uh, yes, and uh, e even with all the recesses and all of that, it would print across that just perfectly um, to give a nice image, like you see behind me. So, yeah. so again, and th then the question is, well, who wants this? Now, I will tell you and your audience that I wasn't the smartest kid on the block. When <laughs> I started this business and invested heavily, um, a substantial six-figure investment in machines, technology, uh, that it was co accompanied this, and the space, of course, to create a business and an office and a warehouse, um, and all the things that go into building a business, all the same things my customers need to consider besides just the machine. The machine mm -hmm. is really cool, but that's not what a business makes. You have mm -hmm. to market it. You have to find your customers. You have to be able to feed your family. You have to put gas in your car. You have to have a car. Um, mm -hmm. So all of those things are important to having a business, not just the machine. Um, so when I looked at this, I said, well, um, and I started this business in December of 2019. Well, we all know in January of 2020, the mm -hmm. world stopped with the pandemic. So here I was with a machine that in North and South America, nobody had ever seen or heard about before. And in fact, outside of Southeast Asia, really, nobody had seen and heard about it before. And so the first thing I had to do was make people aware of it. And so I use social media. Um, and that's what we still use today, three years into it. Uh, we get about 150 inquiries now every single day and using just Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, um, YouTube and our website, um, SEO, search engine optimization to drive people to our website to learn what this is all about. And of course, now where we have the benefit of referrals and we have, as I said, 135 customers that we can refer people to. But initially, we just showed people videos. We showed them pictures of what this was like and what it looked like. And little by little, people inquired. And as they inquired, we would have a, a Zoom call like you and I are having today. And we would share the information about what the machines are, answer their questions about profitability, of cost, return on investment, all that type of stuff. And... Uh, and then people make the decision. Out of those 150 inquiries we get every day, truth be told, 140 of them say, oh, that's not a $100 desktop printer. It's $30,000. And they disappear. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe some of those 140 know somebody who wants a wall printed um, or knows somebody who might want to be in this business or be in a business already, like I described earlier, that might yeah. be interested. But 10 of those people have a serious desire to be in business and 30,000, 50,000, a hundred thousand dollars is not a serious investment for them if the payback makes sense. And if it's an exciting, fun, profitable, and the business makes sense. And those are the people we talk to. And those are the people we try to decide, is this right for them? Are they right for us?
So you made the comment though that when you first started out, you made a few mistakes yourself. And as you said, it's not, it's never about the product or the service. Well, it it, it can be, but it's not like if you build it, they will come. You've got to make sure that you've actually got, I call about the three main components of business. You've got sales and marketing, which is selling the stuff, you've got operations, which is delivering it, and you've got the finance and admin, which means making sure you get paid for it. Um, so and all that has to be focused around a plan that has both a, a long-term vision, a bit of a medium term, and then a short-term plan to actually execute on that as well. So what are the lessons that you've learned from that and how do you share that with people when you're working with them? Uh, so great point. And the only one that you might have left out in that description is the support of the customers you get. Um, critical yep. to the success of any business um, is what kind of support are you going to give them? Um, sure. as, as in, especially in a product like this or whether it's software or whether it's a, a, a television set or a wall printer, um, you need to be able to not only train people, but you need to support them. So, um, so some of the mistakes I made, of course, was not having any idea what I was getting into when I got machines that were all in Chinese. Um, so I had to, I had to, you know, find people to translate everything, um, yep. the software, the hardware, uh, the menus. I had to, I had to build up my team. Um, and, and while people were laying everybody off at the beginning of COVID and the pandemic, I was hiring people. Um, and I was, I was, was, I was all in on this. And so I built up the team to support my customers when they would come. But of course, I, I didn't know who they were at the time. And so we had to go through that. But all of those aspects that you said have to be addressed when you're building any kind of a business. And, uh, and so we did the same thing. Um, in, in other businesses, this, uh, my, my trajectory has not been that hockey stick by any means. <laughs> um, yep. There's I've had businesses that I, I don't like to call them failures financially, but I've had businesses that uh, I refer to as learning experiences. Um, you either marketed the wrong place at the wrong time. I had a restaurant business in New York um, that was very successful. It, it was, and in fact, I'm very proud to say that 44 years later, I founded that in 1979. Uh, 44 years later, that restaurant is still in business today. Oh, wow. um, I don't own it anymore. I got out of it in about 12 years. And the money that I made in 12 years, um, I lost in one year when I moved to Florida and tried to open up a restaurant just like mine. I didn't do the proper market research. It was a different audience, a different clientele than what I experienced in New York uh, versus what I experienced in Florida. And I took a beating. Um, and, and that was a learning experience. So understanding your market, um, mm -hmm. is important. Um, and, and again, doing what we did to try to find out, we took 10 months to do that before we got our first customer. Some of that was, was not because I'm a really smart guy. And, and I took 10 months, you know, just to find out everything I, I needed to know, uh, the pandemic caused me to do that but that was a very good thing so the mm -hmm. the negatives of the pandemic gave me the positive of the time um, and and like you said you know there are things that you need to for the success of any business i call it time talent and treasure you need the time to do something for me it was that 10 months you need the treasure i was fully invested in this and had the capital to do this um, and then uh, the talent i had to build up because once again i know what hats i like to wear I love customer interaction. I like yep. finding out, is this right for somebody? Will somebody want this? Will they make money with it? Um, and learn what they're go going to do with it. And, and we learn more from our customers than they learn from us. I mean, we've had some, some interesting projects by our customers that have taught us things our machine could do that we never envisioned it. And so that's an ongoing project as well, is yeah. to learn exactly what the capabilities are of what it is we're selling. Um, and to, and to again, learn and adapt to the market, I suppose, as the market changes as well, or as you see new opportunities. Sure. And, and we've done that. We've tried to pivot. Um, our business model is one where we offer exclusive territories to people. We are not a franchise. I actually have about 15 years in franchising experience. I intentionally created this business not to be a franchise. We don't want to reach into people's pockets and take yep. revenue from them and royalties and, and tell them that they have to be called the wall printer. We don't build their website. We don't teach them how to use Facebook. Uh, we do provide a lot of videos and content for them to get off the ground and articulate exactly what this can do to evangelize it in their local markets. But we do give them ownership of their market where we sell only to them. They are required on their end to grow and buy more printers from us because we don't compete with our customers. That's something the German company does. They provide services as well as the printers. We don't provide the services. Uh, the only service we provide is support and training for our customers. We, we give them an exclusive territory. Uh, they're required to buy 
printers initially and more printers over time as they build up their market and their audience to be able to support it, uh, because that's the way they're going to hire people, become a real business that's going to create value for themselves and build something that they could then leave to their families, children, employees, or exit when they're ready to exit. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's our business model. And that's something we learned over the time. At the beginning, most people who start a business, just as I've done in the past, you take anybody with a checkbook and a pulse, I call it. Um, yes. and, and, and then you find out soon enough that there are bad customers just because somebody can afford what you're doing or because they like what you're doing doesn't mean that they're the right customer. Uh, mm -hmm. That's something that I've learned uh, the hard way. Um, and now we're at a point where we do have the luxury, um, if not the learning, um, to reject customers that come to us and want to purchase our products when we really understand that they don't really don't. get what's necessary and they're not willing to commit what they need to. Yeah, I think that's true of all businesses, right? I think you, you made a really valid point there. When we first start a business, we will. We'll take anybody with a checkbook because we need to bring in revenue. And I think that it's a lesson I've learned throughout all of my businesses over time is that the more selective you can be from the beginning, um, the more opportunity you actually, you have room for more opportunity. Because the challenge is if you take on board those people who are not the right people, they generally use up a lot more of your resources, a lot more of your mental capacity. They're very demanding. Um, they don't kind of, you know, give back in, in the same same way that the right people would. And there, if you're tied up doing all that work for those people, you've got no time for the for the, the real opportunities, the people you genuinely want to work with. Is that what you found? I absolutely agree with you, Deborah. This yeah. is uh, this is definitely um, a, a requirement, if not um, a mantra of any business is that is that you really do need to identify who those com companies are that you are going to benefit and that mm -hmm. are going to benefit you. It's a two way yeah. street. You know, mm -hmm. we're trying to create this. We, ju we were just awarded um, Coastal Entrepreneur of the Year Award, um, which is which was a really big honor. Um, wow. Congratulations. As, as much, as, well, thank you. But it's as much a testament to my customers and to my employees um, as it is to to myself, having had the vision for this company, uh, yep. because what it does was and one of the reasons we got this award is. The judges, there are several hundred applicants for this award, and we were, and, and they, the judges go by the criteria of if you had $100,000 to invest, what small business would you invest in? And right. so the fact that every every time we sell a wall printer, we're really creating a business opportunity for somebody else. That's what really drove home to the judges and what what um, succeeded in getting us the the award that we did. Um, and that that makes me really proud because it is true that what if if we can go ahead and create a successful business, number one, they're going to buy more printing machines from me, which in turn is going to make me more successful. And so that's that's really what uh, what drives us on a day to day basis. Mm, OK, fantastic. Hey, how do you how do you make sure that you share that vision with all of your team? What do you do to keep that vision kind of top of mind and, and ensure that they are um, you know, executing on that vision day in, day out? I pay them very well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I'll tell you, um, uh, and that's I laugh, but and you laugh, but that's the truth. Um, I believe in sharing. Um, I, you know, one of the best books I ever read was um, "Everything All I Really Need to Know." I learned in kindergarten, um, okay. and one of those things you really need to to have learned is that um, you know you play nice with others, you share. Um, take a nap every day, maybe have some milk and cookies, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, do unto others, basically. Yeah. And so um, I have a revenue share op opportunity for all of my employees. Everybody gets a piece of the action. When we succeed, everybody succeeds. Um, and they have a stake in it and they have ownership. And that's, that extends not only from the sales process, but down to the customer support and wanting and, and the discovery process. When people come and visit us and see the machines in action and talk to us, they realize that we really care about the customers we, we have and the businesses we're trying to create with them or for them with our machines. And so mm -hmm. everybody benefits by that. Um, you know, we try to keep things light. Everybody cooperates with everybody else in any small business. And when I say small business, so I've got 15 employees in my business today. Um, yep. Whether you have two employees or 200 employees, um, you have to have a lot more cooperation, collaboration um, to, to make uh, things run smoothly and for everybody to be successful. Nobody could do it by themselves. I certainly can't. I have a sales team around me, a technical support team. Um, they, they, we work with marketing support, um, 
uh, inter interact on almost a daily basis. When a customer has an issue, sales and marketing needs to know about it so we can refine our message or refine our product to, mm -hmm. uh, to support the needs of our customers and to make our products perform better, have less, uh, less issues uh, that are, might be a barrier to the success of our customers. And yeah. that's an ongoing basis. Yeah. And I mean, that comes down to the whole kind of delegate and elevate. You said you, you're really clear about what hats you enjoy wearing. And we, we call it delegate and elevate. And um, we talk about elevating to your unique ability. So what your unique abilities are stuff that you're great at, that you love doing. And that's usually where you add the most value. So by surrounding yourself with other people that you can delegate those things to, where it is their unique ability and they love doing it, uh, it just makes sense. It's the only way you can grow, right? Yeah, you have to you have to love what you do. And you have to, as we've said a couple of times in this conversation, you have yep. to find out what you're good at and what drives you. Um, yep. you, you. You'll never be successful if you're involved in a job and that job, you may be doing something that isn't your first choice or your only choice. But if you're surrounding yourself with nice people and people that support you and that care about you, and mm -hmm. that also drives you to want to care about the company and their success, and hopefully you benefit by that. Um, owning a business is not for everybody. There's yes. risk involved. Um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of angst involved. Um, mm -hmm. this is not an entrepreneurship is not a nine to five job. Um, and especially when you're dealing with a company, perhaps like mine, where you've got either vendors or manufacturers or customers that are in all sorts of time zones. So, you know, I'm, I'm going generally, you know, maybe I get a few hours sleep every night, but I'm usually up here and there uh, checking yep. emails and everything else. So and, and even if you have a business that's a nine to five job, it generally is not really that because you're thinking about things outside if it's truly something that you love doing. Mm, that's right yeah okay um you have obviously got a huge amount of business experience that you've shared a lot of really great things with us is there three kind of top tips or tools because I mean you've said to us that it, it entrepreneurship is not for everybody it certainly isn't that beautiful hockey stick um curve that we get taught in school it's a little bit more of a I call it a roller coaster ride there are highs there are lows um we have you know we learn from our mistakes and that's a good thing what are the three kind of top things you'd like to share with the listeners in terms of what you've learned from all of your experiences well, for me, it's all always been and hopefully always will be about relationships, um, the relationships you build early on in your life that carry you through. You know, there's, these, there's a saying, you know, be nice to the people on your way up. They're the same people you're going to see on the way down. Um, mm -hmm. either, uh, these relationships can help you through hard times. Uh, they can support you on the good and the hard times. Um, but they're they're always there for the taking, listening, becoming a trusted resource to somebody. Um, there's plenty of times that a customer, uh, we don't have the product or the service they want, that something else may be valuable to them. Having stayed in touch with either your industry or other industries, I've, I've had the good fortune of being involved in probably you know, 20, 25 different types of businesses and industries and products. And so I've, I've gathered, as I said earlier, not a lot of expertise, but a lot of peripheral knowledge about a lot of things. And so I can be a trusted resource to people and maybe point them in a direction that they don't know how to go. And always looking for relationships, listening to people. You have to listen. I know mm -hmm. I've talked a lot in this because, you know, you don't know me and your audience doesn't know me. And I'm trying to give you some background. Uh, but generally, to be successful, you really need to listen, uh, develop a relationship with somebody that lets you find out what they really want and what you can offer. And if you can't offer something, maybe you yeah. can direct them to somebody or something that can fill their need. Um, you know, so I, I think that's relationship building is the most important thing. Um, yeah. And then do your homework. You know, do your homework. Yes. Make sure you are make sure you are looking at something that is a solution to a real problem. Um, mm -hmm. can't can't emphasize that enough. Um, yeah. you can't just do something because it sounds good and it it has it's the sizzle, cool. not the not the steak necessarily. Yep. Um, <laughs> so you know that's that's about it. And of course, make sure you have the resources um, yeah. to pull it through. You don't want to invest in your time and your energy in something that may require and that, and that doesn't mean just money. That means you know you have to surround yourself with people, the talent. Um, or or the finances that are going to mm -hmm. let you get to the point that you envision for yourself or for your business. So yeah, that, all of those that, things, I guess those would be my three top things. That is absolutely fantastic. Hey, look, Paul, if somebody wants to come and talk to you, either as a potential business mentor or interested in, in, the, in the opportunity that you're offering, how would they get in contact with you? 
Yeah, I, I don't know what I don't know. So I'm always looking to for interactions with people. LinkedIn is a great way to reach out to me. Anybody can yeah. find me if they search for Paul Barron on LinkedIn. Feel free to connect with me. If that if that means you want to chat or you just want to engage in my network, feel free to do that. If somebody really does want to know about my specific journey now at the wall printer, you can go to thewallprinter.com. And mm -hmm. fill out a quick form of there and give me your information and, and we can, you know, exchange information and give you, a, you know, a, a path towards uh, learning more about what it is I'm doing today. Uh, but I'm happy to connect with anybody. LinkedIn is the best way to do that. No, that is fantastic. Hey, look, thank you so much for your time. I believe it's afternoon for you. It's morning over here, but thank you for your time today. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you and we'll make sure we have those contact details in the bottom of the podcast link. So, um, yeah, thank you, Paul. Uh, to you as well, Deborah. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed chatting with you and I hope your audience got something out of this. I'm sure that they did. Thank you very much, Paul. Thanks for listening to the podcast show, Better Business, Better Life. My name is Deborah Chantry-Taylor. I'm an EOS implementer, family business advisor, business and leadership coach, podcaster and speaker. However, I'm also a business owner with several current business interests. I'm fortunate to have lived the high life with all the lifestyle, the toys, you name it, and then I've lost it all, not only once but twice in two spectacular train wrecks. I know what it's like to experience the highs and lows. I came across EOS when they launched into New Zealand using my Entrepreneur's Playground and Event Centre in Parnell, Auckland. I love the simplicity of the tools and their philosophies fitted my personal brand statement perfectly. The brilliance is in the simplicity. I've always been passionate about seeing entrepreneurs lead a life they love, and now I help them live that EOS life, doing what they love, with people they love, making a huge difference in the world, being compensated appropriately, and with time to pursue other passions. If you want more information or want to get in contact about using EOS in your business, you can visit my website at debra.coach. That's www.debra.coach. Thanks for listening.